When it comes to Indigenous communities, water quality advisories are nothing new. Earlier this month, Arawapiskat First Nation became the latest place to declare a state of emergency over water. The crisis highlights the long rocky road still ahead for reconciliation. Joining us now for more in Fredericton, New Brunswick, Mark Miller, Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations, and the Liberal Member for Ville-Marie, Le Sud-Ouest, Ile de Sœur. In Thunder Bay, Ontario, Willow Fiddler, video journalist with Aboriginal People's Television Network. And with us in studio, Don Martin-Hill, cultural anthropologist and Paul R. McPherson Chair at McMaster University. Hello to you all. Hi. Hi. Thank you all for being here to help us understand what's going on in Arawapiskat. And just to give an idea to where it's located, we have a map uh, to show where it is in Ontario. It is a small First Nation community of 2,000 people in the far north region of Ontario on the James Bay coast. It's connected to Musini via an ice road in the winter, but is a fly-in community when the ice melts. Uh, Willow, I would like to start with you. Um, the state of emergency began earlier this month. What caused it? Um, well, like you said earlier this month, we learned that Attawapas got declared a state of emergency um, after test results uh, from their water systems showed high levels of a chemical, two chemicals called uh, THMs or HAAs. THM stands for um, trihalomethane and HAA stand for haloacidic acids. Now, these are two chemicals that are commonly found in water systems um, that use chlorine to treat it, and it's uh, apparently when it mixes with organic matter in the water systems, um, these chemicals are produced. So it's usually not a concern, but what is concerning is the levels of these chemicals present and the worry that prolonged exposure to uh, THMs and HAAs can be uh, harmful to people that um, are using it and exposed to it uh, on a regular basis. And in the interim, while um, uh, the government is trying to figure out a way to move forward. What have people in Arawapiska been advised to do when it comes to water? They were advised that um, they had to limit their showers. Um, so, you know, they, the tap water actually they don't use for drinking water. The community does have reverse osmosis units that it does use for drinking water. Residents go take jugs and fill it up. But they do use the tap water for showering, bathing, um, washing their foods, vegetables, things like that, cooking. So um, it is a concern. They were they were warned to, to limit their use to that um, until they're able to uh, get a handle on what happening and what and what the risks are. I know if that was to happen, say, in Toronto on the GTA, um, it would be front page news. Uh, Mark, uh, the Minister of Indigenous Services, Seamus O'Regan, visited the reserve and committed $1.5 million to repairing the current water system. And he said he's committed to building a new water treatment plan in the long term. Will that solve the problem? Well, thanks for the question, Nama. It, this is a question that, that touches first and foremost First Nations communities, some uh, remote like Ottawa, it is not the only one. Uh, the, the solution that the minister announced, uh, it, it happens in two times. First, the short-term interim measures, which included uh, dispatching technical services from, from Indigenous Services Canada to, to, to work on the current system uh, to fix the reverse osmosis system in place. Uh, providing interim uh, drinkable water, uh, also deploying medical teams. So that is what was committed to by the minister uh, as a short-term measure in addition to what you mentioned, uh, pure fixing the, the purification system and the, the investment of $1.5 million. And then in the long term, working with the community uh, to a, get to a solution that would uh, involve the building of a new plant, um, a new source. Uh, Conex to that is, uh, to, is, is the addition to reserve element of acquiring the land necessary in order to get that, that, that source uh, that won't pose the same level of risk. So uh, these, are, these are issues and as you mentioned if this occurred in downtown Toronto uh, it would be front page news. Um, in fact thanks to social media uh, this awareness is, is, is much more at the forefront of people's minds. Um, Indigenous and non-Indigenous Canadians uh, and, and, and it is something Canadians need to realize that there are communities uh, that don't in Canada that don't have drinkable water and this is a human right. Uh, this government committed to made very lofty promises in eliminating committing to eliminate long-term water advisories. Success has been good uh, but partial. I, I, would, I would note the fact that we've uh, lifted over 
85, 86 long-term water advisories, prevented short-term advisories from being put in place, but there are uh, over 50 left, uh, and some with very, very acute situations, some uh, where the solutions are not easy uh, and involve uh, additional massive investments in infrastructure that this government committed to, uh, but we're working towards fixing that solution, uh, fixing that problem uh, by 2021. Well, um, I'm glad you brought up the water advisories. We actually have a graph to show that this is the problem that affects many communities. According to Indigenous Services Canada, four years ago, there were 105 water advisories. As of this month, that number is down to 57. But Mark, I wanted to follow up on something that you said. You said that it's, you know, the government is working um, and it's, uh, they're doing what they can, but Yesterday, according to the CBC, residents in Attawapiskat uh, marched, you know, um, they had signs that said, our kids matter, water is life, our people are dying slowly. And there's also two members of the community, uh, Teresa Spence and Sylvia Kustachin Metawaben, and they've been on a hunger strike for 10 days. Um, so um, it's one thing to say that the government is doing what they're doing now, but this community is experiencing those things in uh, you know, uh, probably more than we are because if you were to tell people in Toronto don't shower or you know don't use hot water um, I don't think that would even happen so do you think that you are doing enough I, look I, I won't substitute um, my point of view for what people in those communities are living and going through when an eight-year-old girl uh, can speak as eloquently as, uh, as as she did to to uh, someone that is perhaps seen as intimidating like a minister of the crown uh, I think it speaks volumes and speaks for itself as to some of the some of the conditions that are third world like uh, in communities and and the work that needs to be done to move this forward. Uh, this government has has put 21 plus billion dollars into uh, indigenous matters, which include the boiled water advisories. Uh, I don't think enough will be done until these uh, in, in, until these advisories are completely gone and and those gaps that exist between indigenous and non-indigenous peoples are closed. Uh, Don, I want to bring you into the conversation. Um, indigenous Services Canada said they would reimburse the council governing Arwapiskat for 1.5 liters per day for adults and one liter per day for infants, uh, as far as water goes, uh, while the water systems are being repaired. Is that enough? Um. I can't speak to it because I don't know what the costs are there. I know in the north, everything is uh, usually exponentially more expensive. Um, but no, it's, it's, it's not enough. Um, there, there needs to be real attention to real crisis. And they're in crisis, as he mentioned, there are a number of communities in crisis from Grassy Narrows to Six Nations, mm -hmm. which is just 45 minutes from Toronto. So, you know, this is a endemic problem that came out of a colonial policy mm -hmm. um, started by Duncan Campbell Scott but probably earlier um, stating that you're going to continue until there's not a single Indian left uh, in the body politic that was 1924 that's you know a century ago and what that did is it didn't allow for First Nations Indigenous people to have infrastructure um, so through our studies in global water futures um, research I had no idea as a resident of Six Nations um, once we started the study how costly day-to-day uh, -day living is for Indigenous families at Six Nations who have to purchase their water um, on a daily basis. So um, it, it's happening across the board. Um, because and, in your community, is it like ten, less than 10% uh, people have w water that's actually coming into their home? Yes, so when, when uh, I mean, we're all thrilled with Trudeau's policy to uh, correct this problem, and I think everybody was excited, and um, I was thrilled to be on a research team that was going to, you know, work with engineers and biologists and ecosystem health and medical practitioners, pediatricians, clinical psychologists to take a holistic look at, at the impact, and, and I was stunned um, to find out that only... 10% of the residents um, were had access to this beautiful treatment plant because you have to pay for the infrastructure and people, it's complex. You mm -hmm. have to do infrastructure, which is really expensive. Um, and then the other problem is there's no waste treatment plant. So it's always these piecemeal approaches, um, whether it's our health, whether it's suicide, whatever it is that doesn't get to the root of, of 
of the problem, which is we need to be brought up to this century and live like other Canadians live. Because are you going to take water and, and, and maybe they'll get clean water, but mm -hmm. the housing is really, uh, as he mentioned, it's third world conditions. So, you know, when you look at health, I'm a health researcher, how do, how do I measure the disparities between our health and Canadians' health, which <laughs> is growing, not, not closing, um, because we're living in these horrible conditions, mm -hmm. which have an overall impact of mental health, suicide. Um, so everything, you're saying everything is connected? Everything is connected, and it's not a one-off, you know, we need, what we could do, and in my view, um, and that it's only not a research statement, but it would seem to me that you would want to um, utilize all the resources you have to rebuild proper communities because we were neglected, we were expected to die out, mm -hmm. they took our children. Um, if we brought all of this forward and said, there are, there's a community in James Bay um, now that has, you know, designed itself, sustainable energy, um, ways to improve the housing, and all those other things will improve. But until you get to the root problem, which is we are forced to live in really terrible conditions that Canadians, A, didn't know about, and B, have no idea that the taxing that that would take on a child's mind. Mm -hmm. And then they question why suicide's so high. Well, you don't need to be a, a clinical psychologist to really look at the overall impact that these daily grinds of just getting ready to go to school. Uh, Mark, I'd like to get you to respond since you're here um, representing the government. Um, what do you have to say uh, to what Dawn just said? Well, as I'd like to elaborate a bit on what Dawn said. Uh, she lives in a community uh, that is close to Brantford. So the, in people's imagination, they say to themselves, and I guess perhaps in some sense it's comforting, they say, oh, this far north and it's, it's, it's problematic. Well, Six Nations is the largest populated uh, First Nation in the country. It's right beside Brantford. The people of Brantford have clean water. Uh, but the levels that Dawn described in terms of people hooked up um, or, or, or access to, to clean water, because there's two distinctions here that need to be drawn. There's the actual hookups to houses and there's the actual access to clean water. And there are two different things. One may require a truck drive whereas the other involves the turning of a faucet. Um, we recently uh, invested, along with the council, into, uh, into getting access to two of the schools. Um, but there are other schools, like the Everlasting Tree School that I visited earlier this year, that don't have that level of hookup. So it's unimaginable uh, for, for, for most Canadians to think that the school that their kid goes to uh, doesn't have safe drinking water. Um, Thanks to the investments, the, the Isle Thomas School and the O.M. Smith Schools will have uh, clean water. Uh, but that isn't the case for all the schools that are in Six Nations. Uh, and that isn't the case for individuals living in their houses that, 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 don't have, uh, that don't have access. And again, there's no excuse because the pr of, the, of the proximity argument. You can't say it's far, it's complicated. Right. Uh, we're talking about a massive undercapitalization that has happened over decades. When we look simply as an indicator at the long-term boil water advisory, some of them have been in place for decades. We've well, Mark, some of them, some remain. Well, Mark, uh, not to interrupt you, but what would it take to ensure everyone has safe drinking water in this province? Um, hard work, money. Uh, working with communities, real engagement, uh, the level of engagement, perhaps even more that this government's committed to. Uh, you know, it's... It, it, Do you think you're moving I, fast enough, though? Pardon me? Do you think that well, you're moving fast enough? It's, it's hard to argue that we can't move any faster, uh, particularly on people drinking unsafe water, but the issues are complicated. They, value, value, they vary from different community to different community. Uh, there are issues with one, the nature and the source of the water, uh, the plant and perhaps the hookups that need to be done, uh, the training. Uh, working, people don't understand that working in a water plant requires a, a level of education that is very sophisticated. Um, if you visited water plants, you have people doing complex chemical uh, calculations, uh, complex math, obviously, uh, as as well as a specific water-related training that's needed to work in one of those Did plants. I, but you have so people here that do that here that? for uh, cities like Toronto, don't you? 
Yes, absolutely. And then the, so what, why we say that, that, that this, this is complex, that plays into the time factor, but it doesn't uh, play into the, the, the level of dedication and commitment that you need from governments, uh, not only federal, but when you're talking about hookups and, and, and uh, infrastructure that is similar to municipal type infrastructure, engagement from the provincial government. Well, Don, uh, Willow, um, I haven't heard from you for a little bit. How does this state of emergency affect the mental health of residents? <clears throat> Um, so, I mean, Attawapiskat, I mean, like Mark said, is not the only community or First Nation to, to be facing these challenges, particularly here in Northern Ontario. Um, there's about 20 communities that are under boil water advisory, both short term and long term. Ibmatung First Nation also this month declared a state of emergency because of high THM levels as well. Um, they've been under a boil water advisory for 18 years um, as of August 1st. Niskanika First Nation um, is also facing similar challenges and they've been under a boil water advisory for 25 years. And I was there just recently in Niskanika and um, toured the water treatment plant. It's uh, almost completed. And they were running into problems last winter. They had to um, also declare a state of emergency because the contractors they hired were taking too long. And they're, I mean, they're months behind schedule, but they're gonna be completing that soon. But the worry right now from the chief is that no one's gonna trust the water coming out of the taps, even when it is safe and clean, mm -hmm. because there's a generation now um, that have grown up um, under this boil water advisory, so they don't know what it's like to have access to that safe tap water, to, to, to go to the sink, to grab a glass and get a, a drink of water from the tap and drink it. We, you know, and, and this, this doesn't, it's not only in the community, but community members, when they leave and, and go somewhere else, for example, Thunder Bay or Toronto, they still will not use the tap water because that trust is just not there at all. So um, the mental health impacts um, are quite, quite significant. Um, yeah, I'd like to respond to the um, discussion all around, like Six Nations has the highest post-secondary population. I mean, our, our people are going to universities, they're um, going to Mohawk College, McMaster, five other universities. They're very lucky because in some ways, um, at the same time, you know, doing this research project, partnering with uh, Mohawk College so that we can get our people trained to run treatment centers, it's like a you're doing it by yourself and you're just wondering, you feel like I'm doing the government's job and I shouldn't be doing this, but we need people trained to run these treatment plants. Not only that, they gave Six Nations the money for the treatment plant. They didn't give money to operate the treatment plant. So again, you, you, you get, you, you make one movement, but it's like three steps back. A, we don't have enough people trained, even though we all have the will to create a program to work towards helping other people from Northern Ontario or have, take programs that are relevant to First Nations water monitoring and treatment. But you just don't have the will. It seems like the government talks to the AFN and, 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 and all the people on the ground who are experts and who are doing all this research have no inroad to those conversations. So that's, that's one area I'd like to... Also, we pay for our water. So as a resident of Six Nations, you know, I've paid for my water and I continue to do so, but I also have to pay for the waste. And when you add that up, which is what our survey is going to be doing, you're looking at four to $500 a month if you have a family of five or six. That's a mortgage or car payment. You know, um, if so, you I, pay. You go somewhere to get the water, or you I, have you to pay. It? You have to pay the public works to come and take away the waste. Yeah. So that's eighty dollars. If you're in a hurry, you had company, then it's one hundred and forty dollars, and you could pay that on a weekly basis, which mm -hmm. I would do when my daughter and her family were living with us for a while. We have to build our own houses. Uh, my daughters are building their house. Fifty thousand off the top goes to water and septic and all these infrastructures that Canadians just to get to plug into. And then I pay interest on that money. So people, Canadians need to understand, we're working really hard and, and we're, I pay taxes. Um, most of us work off reserve and yet I don't receive the services. My kids go to a school that's in a lacrosse arena in order to learn Mohawk. You know, so, so it, there's a very unfair perception out there that we're not trying to help ourselves or and 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 we are it's mm -hmm. just 
there's a real disconnect in terms of um, the expertise that could be tapped into versus a very political negotiation um, without a whole lot of strategic planning to address the, the, the issue in the long term. Uh, Mark, uh, Don mentioned that uh, there's a lack of will um, for the government to resolve this. Do you agree to that? I, I don't think will is, is lacking. I want to speak specifically on, on the school because I, I went to a board meeting for that school and, and I heard about the need to, to build a new school. I mean, the, the, the situation that that school sitting above an arena even though uh, even though they've 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 persisted in, in, in just through the sheer will of educators to to have kids learning their language, uh, it, it isn't acceptable. It's simply above a lacrosse arena. So uh, the, the government's committed to doing preliminary studies for a new school. Um, again, and that's all at, at its infancy. But I wanted to clarify that at, at the outset. Uh, this isn't a lack of will uh, or public pronouncements. If anything, we've been criticized for not uh, realizing quickly enough on a lot of our pronouncements. In a lot of areas, uh, I would point specifically to governance, we've been told to slow down. Um, again, people pointing out that you can't have the same old federal government marching in, telling First Nations, um, Inuit and Métis for that matter, what they should or shouldn't be doing. So that involves a partnership, that involves a lot of dialogue, it can involve some very painful discussions. Um, the real challenge is uh, is having that level of engagement, committing commitment, uh, priorities, understanding that uh, communities don't work in the same way as bureaucrats work, which is to put things into different envelopes and categorize things. It's a it's a whole of government approach. It's a whole of community approach, and we've had we've had struggles. Uh, and I'm ready to admit it, we've had struggles uh, reconciling that and understanding that things are connected and that they need to be resolved, one, in a whole of government approach, two, in a whole of community approach. And that's what, that, that slows things down, but it, in my mind, uh, it isn't a lack of will uh, or a lack of investment since we've probably, and I believe this is, this is an uncontrovertible fact, we've invested more money than any government, 21.4 billion into these issues. Uh, and I don't think there's any government in our history that has done so. But there's, um, just to pick up on what you just said, um, of, of everything that you've done and things being slowed down, um, but there's a sense of urgency in the communities that are being affected. Um, so you've talked about what the federal government has been doing. Do you see a role for the provincial government to get involved in this? Absolutely. Uh, the. Uh, the honor of the crown, the fiduciary duty exists both at the provincial crown as it does uh, at the federal crown. We have uh, the additional responsibility uh, under the constitution, uh, whether it's section 91 or uh, or section 35 of, of the charter. So uh, clearly there, there's a partnership. One of the frustrations we also hear, and we'll, we will see this, and we've experienced it through the child and family legis legislation is an issue of jurisdiction and who asserts what while there are still uh, First Nations children, uh, Indigenous children, in care more than the, uh, there were uh, students at the height of the residential school system. This is something that's unacceptable for Indigenous people first and foremost, but unacceptable for all Canadians. Uh, it is unacceptable for a community to be, to be told, we don't do this because that's the provincial jurisdiction. So my job is to pick up the phone, work with our partners at the, uh, at the provincial level. Uh, and, and resolve those issues. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes the partner isn't there, uh, and that's very unfortunate, but then we get into discussions as to who, who, fill the, who fills the gap, um, and, and that's why we, we, we actually have something called the Jordan's Principle. Um, Willow, um, we only have a few minutes left. Um, I wanted to ask you this question. In the lead-up to the two, uh, 2050 election, uh, Justin Trudeau said a government led by him would address the drinking water issues as a top priority. How has, um, what grade would you give his government? Well, <clears throat> I'm not sure what kind of grade I'm going to give that, but, you know, I spoke with Chief Ignace Gull of Attawapiskat yesterday, and him, I think, like many other First Nation leaders in the country, really took to heart um, the Prime Minister's commitments or promises um, when he was elected. And, and you know, the, the chief of Attawapiskat said that he promised to, to end all boil water advisories. And he's saying that's just, it's not happened. It's not, the work that has um, been done has not been enough. And First Nations, the bottom line, First Nations are still screaming for safe and clean mm -hmm. drinking water. Um, why that continues to be the reality um, Today, I'm not sure, but I think going into the election, um, 
people are going to remember what he promised four years ago, and we'll be really questioning um, whether he, you know, whether he can deliver in the next four years. Um, Don? Yeah, I think um, just responding to the minister there, the, the, the lack of will is to take a strategic approach um, to resolving some of these issues. So. Um, a lot of the money was released, but Six Nations um, wasn't on that uh, priority list, if you will. So, um, and we appreciate what Northern relatives are going through. It. I work with Grassy Narrows, um, but what we did, you know, dealing with mercury is a complex issue. Um, so there's there's a need to take this overall issue and address it as a strategic, as you would any country. As If you're gonna deal with Iran, you know, you're not gonna do it in a piecemeal fashion. You're gonna sit down and you're going to bring all the resources you have to address the overall issue, long-term, short-term. Mm -hmm. And that's where I find it's piecemeal and it's on a four-year cycle. Um, and it's, and it's a real concern now with the election coming. If the government was to uh, change, then it would be reset again, right? Yeah, and I mean, you know, Ontario has a very unique situation now with Doug Ford, you know, reducing a lot of the um, good things that were happening. So, you know, we're always in this frenzy. If we don't get this done while Trudeau is in, what's going to happen? You know, so we need to do a long term plan as a country that doesn't rely on who's in office, but makes a Canadian commitment to resolve these issues. Don, thank you so much for your input. Mark and Willow, we appreciate your time. We've run out of time. Um, and that's it for tonight's agenda in the summer. I'm Nam Kiwanuka. Thanks for watching TVO and for joining us online at TVO.org. We'll see you again next time. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.